Welcome to the Patients Learning Center. This is a real treat for us at the Landing School to have an, inter uh, an interview by Brian Harris with uh, Cy Hamlin, very notable uh, yacht designer. Uh, Cy has definitely been in a variety of different positions in his career. Uh, he has been notably a yacht designer for his own yachts, uh, controversies typed. He's worked for uh, the UN and the World Bank. He helped teach here at the Landing Boat School when the yacht design was uh, in its infancy, uh, in which case then he, uh, Brian was one of his students at a partial, at a part time. Brian now is a general manager up at Maine Yacht Center, uh, alumni from the past, like I said, in yacht design, and uh, a worldwide sailor. So it's a very pleasure to have you two uh, kind of talk to each other and give us your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Si, it's an honor to be here. Well, it's an honor to be w with you. I think this is great. This is so um, for historical purposes, I uh, went to the Landing Boat School in 1983. I graduated in 1984, and Cy, si, you were the primary lecturer, uh, primary guest lecturer yeah. for, uh, for my yacht design class. Yes, right. And then uh, I had the good fortune to share some office space with you for a few years after yeah, I, I graduated. Yeah, good. And I was, uh, I, was, uh, I was admired all the work that you had done. And it was a joy to be in your presence for those few years. And I think we're going to have a nice conversation right now. Well, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's good. Let's yeah. start with these models that I see here. Well, maybe we should start with uh, the uh, museum okay. that we hope will eventually fill the center here. And uh, in my travels around the world, I picked up little boats and uh, model boats and brought them home and I had quite a collection and when I came to moving I thought what uh, uh, what will I do with the models and I thought why not have a, a uh, uh, museum because I had realized that in the United States all the muse marine museums are about uh, American vessels. There's nothing about foreign vessels. I felt this was a, a gross uh, oversight, true all over the world, as a matter of fact. But uh, the, uh, the result was that I approached the school here about filling up some of these this space with a teensy tiny little uh, marine museum for foreign vessels and these are some of the vessels that uh, I uh, uh, I have gathered up over the way and I'll just describe a few because they're from three different continents which is the way I like it the far far boat over there the uh, looks a little bit like a dory is a bateau and it was used in the uh, lumbering uh, days when they were running logs down the, uh, the r r creeks and uh, rivers and there would be two fellows in one of those and they would keep the logs going right so they wouldn't get jammed up. Um, that's that's uh, North America. Uh, secondly is this vessel here which is uh, from the Maldive Islands and it was used for uh, fishing out there very successfully and uh, they were home built, uh, built very uh, simply but very well. They normally would last about 25 years before they'd have to start replacing parts. And for the third little vessel there, it's a kind of an odd one, but it's a Greek sponging vessel from uh, from Europe. So we have now uh, Asia, Europe, and uh, uh, the, uh, North America. So uh, this represents the range of vessels. Now you haven't, nobody in the United States has seen one of those vessels working away of uh, sponging unless they've been to Greece. And it's too bad that the, all the people who haven't been to Greece have missed that site. So anyway, that's the 
reason for these three models here and is the reason for me to be here is this, uh, uh, I would like to call it, the Landing International Maritime Museum. Hmm. And how many models in total are we talking about? Well, we're Roughly. talking, it uh, depends on whether I'm, I'm optimistic or pessimistic. <laughs> I would say about 35 or 40, something like that. Wow. Mm -hmm. And are they all full models like this? No, they're half models, there are unfinished models, they're all kinds, but they all represent a particular uh, type of boat. Uh -huh. and From a particular region. From a particular region, and it's amazing. Uh, I remember in Colombo once getting, waking up at my motel and looking out in the bay, and there must have been 100 or 150 canoes out fishing. I guess that was the time to fish. Mm -hmm. All different colors and everything. Fascinating. Nobody sees that unless they are crazy enough to wake up at six in the morning. So these are all models that you've collected personally throughout yes. your professional career and your travels to different regions. That's right. Huh. That's right. The, the, the uh, bateau I get, bought at an auction for PBS, by the way, which is a good buy. <laughs> and uh, this one is from the Maldive Islands, which is a tiny little country uh, southwest of India and is going to become notable because it's going to disappear. As the water rises, the uh, country gets smaller and smaller. The highest point so far is about six feet above sea level. And the president of this country has been uh, hitting the uh, capitals of the world trying to get somebody to offer them some kind of sucker for what, what you do with a country that's going to disappear. And uh, so this has a special significance for me. And the, the little uh, sponge boat is similar to the boats uh, found in this in Florida and in the West Coast that uh, were used for sp it's for sponging. Uh, they're taken from the old right. sponge boats. Right now, um, seeing all these models reminds me. Didn't you also spend some time at uh, Stevens Institute for for tank, yes. for tank towing? So you've got a long history of being a model admirer. Well, I am a model admirer, and it's kind of interesting because. Stevens is a high-tech place where I went to get some idea of hydrodynamics, which is very difficult if you're a 12-year-old kid. <laughs> and uh, I went there after leaving the Army and ha had a wonderful experience. But it's all high-tech, and uh, the, the, the problem is that very little of uh, uh, an actual fact is high tech. For instance, they have very smooth waves in the model tank. Well, they're not. They're, they should be uh, r rough and, and more realistic. breaking and, yeah. and uh, big ones and little ones and so what. So, so Stevens Institute was an important way stop in my getting to where I hope I am now. <laughs> right, right. Certainly I can see where your love of models would have come from. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, uh, these boats I designed, I redesigned uh, those to be better suited for power. The originally, original boats had uh, just oars and sail, and then the Japanese or some of the Maldivians decided we ought to have an engine, so they put an engine in, and the propeller weighed way back in the stern there, and the propeller stuck about a third of the way out of the water and had no cover, so it, uh, it, it just didn't work very well. And so I was able to take their native design and build it, uh, re re reshape it to better take a propeller, and for other purposes with a better boat. That's great. That's great. So is the, is the hope that these models are donated to the school and they'll stay here in this library and they'll be on display and perhaps uh, attract 
donations from, of other models from other places? That's, that's very much in, in the cards. The uh, special point is to uh, attract people with, who have one or two models and don't really know what to do with them and send me a picture of it and say, would you like to have this? And I say, you bet. Right. And, um, but uh, my, these, um, a couple of these may stay up here uh, and be the start of the actual collection, which I think is in, within a few weeks of being for reaching fruition here. Yes. So what a wonderful resource for the students here as well, to be able to see different hull shapes and rigging and the way well, well, people it is. are. Uh, here, two pictures here. Uh, the uh, upper picture is uh, of a British uh, uh, boat of 1890. <laughs> and uh, the lower picture is a boat I designed for myself that was launched in 1992 and which my wife and I sailed together for uh, 12 years until we thought it was kind of crazy for two people that didn't handle themselves very well in the water to be uh, sailing around all by themselves. I, I can remember seeing that boat on the Agamogan Reach for yes, many consecutive yes, seasons. Yes. Yes, she, uh, uh, well, uh, I wish I had her now, and I wish I wasn't as old as I am. <laughs> but uh, the, the interesting thing about those two boats is that the upper one, they had no materials such as we have. They had bronze, and they had wood, and they used some steel in their boats. But uh, now boats are all fiberglass and stainless steel and uh, materials like that. And yet, uh, I used that boat, that picture, to demonstrate how even with those, uh, like a wooden mast. Now that wooden mast doesn't look very big. You'd think a wooden mast would be that big. It's only about that big, but it's just as strong as the aluminum mast used now, but the skill and the design care that went into those is unbelievable. The sails themselves, they were, they were uh, canvas and uh, the, the, uh, the uh, canvas stretches, you could use it for maybe a couple of weeks, and then you had to buy a new one. That's not so now. We use the same sails, mainsail there for uh, 12, 14 years. Probably still going strong. Now, the, um, the elder yacht here, correct me if I'm wrong, is that is that um, strip plank wood epoxy that construction? That is a wooden boat in a day of, uh, of mostly fiberglass and some aluminum boats. But the way it is built, the top sides from the chine up to the deck is plywood. And the bottom, which gives me a chance to make a nice curve when I design the boat and give the fore and aft curves too, is glued strip, which means the square strips of cedar glued in this case with epoxy resin. And the boat in 12 years never leaked. I mean, I think that's even better than fiberglass boats can say. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I believe that this is the coming material. For one thing, you can do it yourself. You can build your own boat there, Chris. <laughs> now, that's the same construction method as was your series of controversy designs, is that they correct? Were, uh, some were plywood, plywood and, and uh, glued strip. Some were all glued strip. Mm -hmm. And uh, the 44-footer I designed was all glued strip, too. We, we should talk about the controversies for a little bit, because it, it, yeah. first of all, the name is perfect for a, a, a subject of conversation, because yeah. it's a controversy. But the, those date back to the 50s, or...? or, 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 or yeah, it's uh, about the 50s it's, they started. Uh, Farnham Butler was a boat builder and at the head of Soma Sound, and I lived at the other end of the Sound in Manson. And 
uh, he had he had seen uh, one of my little boats, uh, good strip boats, and he had a customer that was looking for a boat that he couldn't find for him. So I designed this glued strip boat for him, which worked out very well, a very nice boat. And uh, so Farnham got interested in the whole glued strip idea instead of frames and planks and leaks and stuff. And uh, he, he, uh, he suggested we go for the British idea, which has a shear like that, whereas the Americans have a shear like this. Now, why, why is that so? Well, people wonder about that. They look at a reverse shear boat like that, and they think, oh, that's an ugly looking boat, until they get used to it. One, one famous yachtsman went for a sail in one, and when he came back, a week's cruise, when he came back, he said, uh, when, uh, when I rode out to it, I didn't think I could be seen climbing on such an ugly boat. But when he came back, he said, it's a fine, handsome boat. So uh, th this was, these were, these were e either shear you wanted. Uh, this shear is made because usually in the Friendship Sloop, for instance, they had to pick, out, pick up uh, lobster traps. Mm -hmm. And the minute the tra lobster trap left the water, it gained about three times in weight. So they wanted to have it break out of the water just as, uh, uh, as easily as, as close possible. to the deck as possible so they could just tip it onto the deck. Mm -hmm. So that's why they have this very low shear in the, uh, at the breast of the cockpit. What and stands out for me most and what has resonated most for me over the years is is the fact that the controversies and that construction method produced such a light, strong v vessel. That's and I think right. I think those concepts were way ahead of their time. And I don't know whether you've received the, the credit and the accolades that perhaps you should have over all these years, but certainly the trend in all yacht design now, whether it's performance vessels or yeah. cruising vessels, is light displacement. I mean, yes, it, well, it is certainly. It's is. come full yeah. circle. It's yeah. taken decades yeah. Yeah. to get there now. But I mean, your concepts of construction methods and and light weight and stiffness that you you implemented into those series of controversy designs yes. sixty yes. sixty years ago is you know finally yeah. taken hold as a general accepted practice in yacht design now. I remember uh, one time when we done quite a few of these light displacement boats and I uh, inquired of a, of a uh, fiberglass builder whether he could build, build one of these boats because the everybody same, was buying at, at the same And weights. he looked at the plan and he said, we can't build it that light. Right, sure. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Especially with the materials available for fiberglass boat building back then, I'm sure it would have been much heavier. And the materials are still available. But the best of all is the northern white cedar, which is common here in New England, mm -hmm. and makes a wonderful, wonderful planking. Mm -hmm. And that construction method is adopted right here now at, this, at the Landing Boat School. The, the boats that are yes, being built yes, are yes. primarily mm -hmm. some form of strip plank. Or That's right. It's just, it's just always sort of interesting to me because when I started my career, you know, everything was heavy displacement, displacement, yeah. displacement, yeah. displacement, yeah. Yeah. and I was yeah. around one of the pioneers of light displacement sailboat yeah. design, yeah. and it just was decades before I came myself full circle yeah. around, and now everything that we build is very light as well. I just think it's just credit to your your thinking and your design philosophy that you were able to, to implement well, I was, I was part of a trend. Sure. Uh, the, 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 actually, glued strip has has been used for I don't know how long up in, the, uh, up in Canada, and it uh, uh, seems to work pretty well, very yeah. well. They, they don't have glue. They put uh, red lead in or something like that, but it makes these good boats that, that look very well. And, uh, there are some who say that the Egyptians and the and the uh, um, Vikings built essentially strip boats, hmm. and of course uh, this type of boat here 
is built of coconut. Uh, and they put the planking on, they make the planking the shape they want, and then they put a few frames in. It's not the other way around. We build, we put the frames in and uh, uh, then plank around it, which is kind of cumbersome sometimes. But certainly the controversies might have been one of the few series of designs that were built on a sort of a production or a semi-production level oh, using wood yes. epoxy construction. The, uh, the, um, uh, I'm keep trying to remember the name of the, uh, uh, the uh, Amper, uh, anyway, the, uh, the boat that the Farnham built many of up there, both as kits and as finished boats, uh, were favored for trailing. You know, they were big boats. They had four bunks and a closed toilet and a nice galley and a cockpit and everything. And uh, were lightweight enough so you could trail to them. be trailed on the highway. Right. In fact, they would have a, a, an annual regatta, and the boats would come in from a trailer all over, from all over to the come venue. To gather and, and sail together. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Do you remember roughly how many of the different controversy series were built? Uh, well, uh, w one thing was that uh, you could be given restrictions and like the uh, the uh, these trailer boats could be uh, they had to be trailable and so you get doing it one way and having a centerboard in a certain way and having a centerboard uh, but I've had this uh, I, just recently one of my boats, one of the last ones I designed, was a 41-foot yawl, has been hauled at uh, uh, Portland Yacht Service uh, last year. I don't know if it was this year or not. Was it a controversy? It was a controversy. Yeah. Well, it was a controversy. It was a reverse year. It's 41. green, I think. I've seen that boat around. Yeah. Yeah, up in Portland, yeah. yeah. Now she was, she's at least 50 years old, right. and you look at her and you say, no, she's not 50 years old. Right. I know the previous owner of that boat, it was the Miller family, Sam Miller. Yeah. He, he, he might have sold it recently, but he and his wife and his two girls, who are friends with my son, yeah. took a couple of years off, and they went cruising to the Caribbean and back on that boat. Yeah, and they, oh, I'm sure. Yeah. The, the original owner that I designed it for was a retired Columbia professor professor and he sailed it alone hmm. and he had a big heavy roads sloop that he just couldn't handle all the gear in it right. so he liked these and he sailed one for a few days and said I'll have one right. huh, amazing. so I was able to satisfy him a great boat he was he continued to let sail on it until he died yeah, it's still being sailed now Pardon? It's still being sailed now. Oh yeah, and the the owners have not changed it as far as I can see. A yeah. Great deal. Right. Uh, let's talk about this photograph here, Si. This is the Clearwater, right? That's the Clearwater. And she was designed uh, in the in the early '60s. Would that have been right? She was launched. Uh, the Clearwater was launched in 1969, but there had been a couple of years before that of uh, trying to get around the Coast Guard rules, which we couldn't do, right? And that works fine. That satisfies the rules just fine. That was probably one of the earlier sailing school ships that was designed and and built for educational purposes. Well, it was, and it was interesting to me because just before uh, this was designed for Pete Seeger, the, the uh, the uh, folk singer, and much, much more than that. He was a remarkable man. But anyway, he called me up and asked if I could design a uh, Hudson River sloop. And uh, so I said, yes, I could, not knowing what a Hudson <laughs> River sloop was exactly, but if I could find a picture of one, I could design it. But just before then, a boat had been lost in the Gulf of Mexico 
uh, it's been made into a movie. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. It, was a, it was a sailing school ship, correct? A sailing school ship. Right. And uh, a couple of people were lost in it, fortunately not many. And the Coast Guard had approved it. So the Coast Guard went back to their drawing board and they made, uh, they tightened up the, uh, uh, the regulations. Uh, regulations considerably to make it even safer. And the Clearwater was, as far as I know, the first boat designed to their new rules. And the clear water is like that. I mean, most boats are like that. The clear water was like that, so that when you heel just a little bit, you got the deck underwater. <laughs> and that's a crucial point in right. all that. <laughs> the Coast Guard's not fond of decks underwater, I don't that's think. That's right. Well, they, they, they want to know what's happening when that starts, because you start losing stability. Sure. Then. But uh, she has been sailing since 1969, and uh, is... Uh, just going to do it for another 100 years, I guess. And, and she was built here in Maine, is that correct? She was built by Harvey Damage. Harvey Damage yes, right? yes. And uh, a wonderful builder who uh, could do the quality of work that he was paid to do. He could turn out a, almost a piece of junk, but not quite. <laughs> but on this boat, he took a very great interest in it and was... Uh, Sometimes I'd wake up in the morning with a phone ringing, and I'd pick up the phone and, and sigh. And I'd say, Harvey, how's everything going? It's lousy, because he had found some something that I'd done wrong, perhaps, or some of their men had done wrong. Or some construction but, detail yeah, that wasn't going correctly. Yeah, yeah. But he was a wonderful guy to work with. It must have been quite a launching party that you had up there. Pardon? It must have been quite a launching party on launch day for the Clearwater. It must have been a lot of people yes. that came up from New York, I would imagine. Yes, well, I spent a year or so with uh, uh, Pete Seeger coming up and visiting me and discussing things. And then when the boat got started, he, he, uh, he would come up and stop, pick me up, and we'd go up and watch, look at it together and discuss various points of it. And uh, they, the, the, the crew wanted to um, participate in the building. They wanted to be part of the building, but they couldn't find a place to rent in South Bristol until Ed Myers uh, took his uh, bit in his teeth and offered them his house. Uh, terrified, you know, the, the stories of drugs and drinking and smoking and swearing and all that kind of stuff. Well, there's absolutely none of it. Pete didn't drink, smoke, or swear. Huh. And uh, most of the people around him did only mildly uh, a little bit. So they had a fine time up there. And when the boat was launched, which had its own thrilling moments, after the boat was launched, before it sailed away, these people who were almost almost all musicians gave the town a uh, oh, a concert, uh, a concert oh, nice. they, down by the bridge there, the drawbridge, and but uh, of course the the whole th th idea of the of the clear water was to have um, clear clear water, right? Clean in, drinking in water. The Hudson. Right. That's why it was built to make clear water. Well, when the boat was launched, wouldn't you know, out from under the shed came this flood of beer cans and bottles <laughs> and papers and... Trash. Trash, tra trash <laughs> is the nicest thing you could call it. And, uh, well, what had happened was that Pete had gone to uh, Harvey and said, we've got to clean up this uh, barn before we have the launching. We want it spotless. So they made it spotless, and Harvey said, well, put it down there. There's a big hatch in the floor. So Pete, not knowing, had it all dumped down there. Well, it just dumped down onto the bottom, and um, when the tide, when the tide came, came up the day of the launching, <laughs> it floated it all out. <laughs> so he got a bad name for that, which is totally undeserved. Actually, he cut everything off. He got a couple of... Uh, 
pickup trucks and uh, his crew together, and they cleaned it all out the first time. It sounds like maybe that was a, a conspiracy by Harvey Gamage, huh? <laughs> well, I think it probably amused them greatly. Yes, yeah. I should think so. Yeah. 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 Huh. Huh. Well, it's certainly a timeless design, and it's been doing wonderful work on the Hudson River for decades well, it, now. It has. It has. It's been in the forefront. And uh, one thing about Pete's uh, use of it is that uh, nobody should be kept off the boat by not being able to pay for it. So he normally, unless it was a special occasion, but he'd have a, a barrel uh, put in what you want to, and yeah. they'd, uh, that's the way it keeps going. Uh, also, the New state of New York has given it quite a lot of money, recognizing what it has done for the Hudson. At the time it was built, uh, designed, there was the Hudson was an impossible place to get to. Uh, uh, because there were railroad tracks on both sides, filth down yep. in the once you cross the railroad track, yep. and this has contributed mightily to making it a clean river. People go down and swim in it and have a fine time. Yeah, and think about how many thousands of school children over oh, all these years yeah. have been out on that and been educated yes. about environmental ideas yeah. and, and and ideas. Yeah. Yeah, we'd have uh, 40 or 50 on it sometimes. Right. School kids would come and practice uh, sailing, how to sail, and uh, uh, fishing, and what to do with the fish. Right, that's great. Yeah. I'm not sure I know the, the history correctly, but the, the Clearwater was a, a, uh, an educational sailing vessel that we've, that we've been talking about that you designed and is still yes. in service today. And then there was also the Hurricane Island pulling boats. That's right. Did they come after the Clearwater, or was that before? They were before. Oh, before. They were okay. before, yes. Uh, uh, Peter Willauer, who started the, brought the uh, marine side of Hurricane Island of, uh, I forget what the name was, is in Britain, but it started in Britain. Oh, I didn't. He brought it over and decided to build uh, Hurricane Island. Mm -hmm. Uh, outward Bound Camp, and uh, he uh, needed a boat of some kind, and so we were we knew each other, and he was in Southwest Harbor quite often. So we got to talking about it, and I offered to design him a boat that would be safe, would have enough. Uh, pizzazz to be fun, but would be rowable with no motor, no motor. It's all done by sail and oars. So I uh, designed these boats. I, I took um, old ancient whaling boats and the surf boats uh -huh. and the navy whale boats and and put them together into what is turned out to be a fairly successful oh, boat. More than fairly successful, yeah. incredibly successful. That program's been in, around for 50, 60 well, years or something was, like that. It uh, was 1964 that the first one was launched, right. I believe. And uh, they, they were built with this glued strip construction with reinforcing uh, thickness to because if they hold it up on the beach. Right. And it had two sails, uh, which were uh, very simple sails, and uh, ten oars. <laughs> and, Human power. Uh, pardon? Human, Human power. power. Yeah. Well, I went on a three-day uh, trip on one of those, and it's great. Uh, you, you could keep going uh, rowing with, uh, with four oars or uh, six oars, say, with eight people, you could keep rowing indefinitely because right. you, when one person got tired, You'd another switch one out. was already rested. Right. And uh, we, we, there were two of us, and we had races and everything. Now, these boats were pretty good sailors, actually, but they were not racing boats. Sure. And the idea was not how fast you could go, but how fast you could go relative to the other guy. <laughs> and that made all the difference in the world. And they were excellent vehicles for teaching seamanship and 
working together that's and right. outdoor right. adventure and outdoor education. And that's right. I mean, we used to see, you still see those boats, you know, in Penobscot Bay and yeah. Egamogan Reach yeah. and even further east yeah. with yeah. kids on their first outdoor learning experience, yeah. learning yeah. how to sail and boat handling skills. And Many of them not knowing which end of a boat went first, that's really, right. when they got started. But um, uh, it's true, and uh, the idea was that these were safe boats, and it was just a big open boat. I mean, you would say, oh, it's just a big open boat. It can't be safe. Well, it had flotation in it and things like that, and also built of wood. It had a natural flotation Buoyancy, in it, too. Yeah. And every once in a while, the newspapers, uh, when they're a uh, Nor'wester came bursting out of Canada and blew out over the coast here, one would go missing. Well, the papers would make a big flap about this, you know. And they'd find him 40 miles offshore, you know. <laughs> Bobbing around. Everybody getting uh, sleeping and telling stories and playing games. And when the one went down, they sailed back in. Never has a life been lost from one of those boats, so far as I know. I think it must be thousands and thousands of kids have gone through that program. Uh, yeah. I'm sure of it. Many yeah. knowing nothing about boats right. or boating. Yeah. I mean, it, it was so successful that they moved operations to the Florida Keys in the wintertime. That's right. They'd bring they all did. the boats down there, and they would, they'd operate the same, the same program in the wintertime out of the Florida Keys. I think they have a couple down there still on permanent service. And also, the Ecuadorian Navy asked if they could build a couple. So really? <laughs> they, they liked the idea, uh -huh. not as a functional warship, but right. for this practice. For, for yeah. training. Training. Yeah. Now, did the boats have a centerboard for, for yes, helping during sailing? Yes, yeah. they had a, just a shallow keel like this, and a centerboard, a steel centerboard, hmm. went down through it. And... Uh, they sail pretty well, you know. Uh, if you if you weren't trying to yeah. sail in the America's Cup or right, something, right. you could tack up a sure. place like that. <laughs> one incident that when they first brought brought the first one down to Hurricane Island, they decided to uh, have a demonstration of what happened when one filled. If one filled. So they got the first boat out there in the middle of it, the, the uh, um, quarry and lots of people around and they couldn't ta capsize it. It was a the, wash? That they uh, they no, filled it with no, water? No, it was, it was it just to get it full of water, they had to oh, okay. capsize it. <laughs> right. And they couldn't capsize it. And they got more and more people on the side and finally were able to capsize it and uh, after that bailed it out and uh, I mean she floated that far up out of water right. she wasn't anywhere near submerged and uh, but that was a pretty convincing demonstration to the parents that, to be that uh, they were standing there letting their kids go out and unsafe boats. Right. Now, those boats didn't require Coast Guard certification, did they? Um, I'm not really sure. I think they had to have some kind of certification, but they had no power. In right. Them, so, and that made the difference. Right. That, but the Coast Guard will not let a group get themselves in way of danger. They'll make a rule right now <laughs> right. that will prevent it. Because we had that with the Clearwater at one point. Uh, wanted to avoid the Coast Guard in interference. And um, when it came right down to it, the, the officer said, you know, no matter what you do, what's your scheme, how good it is at getting rid of the Coast Guard, <laughs> we're going to license that boat. Right, we're going to inspect it. We're yeah. going to <laughs> inspect it and right. license it. Right. right. And, um, but those, those were two of, my, uh, two of my most pleasing jobs because they benefited, benefited so many people. But I've had some foreign jobs. Uh, some of my boats uh, in the Maldives, that's the standard uh, 
boat over there, and that's their only industry is fishing. And an uh, 85-foot uh, teak uh, shrimper, of which two were built in India. That's been good. 85 feet, that's a very large fishing that's vessel. A, that's a, she was a big one. Right. Huh. And uh, other, other foreign-built boats, which have been successful in Panama, for instance. So this again is inducing me to get this uh, museum going to uh, because my uh, attempt in in any uh, in any uh, taking taking these boats for instance I used their basic boat their basic construction but I just twitched it here for a better motor propeller push it there for better uh, ice hold and steering and things like that. So uh, and that was, must have been 20, 25 years ago, and they're still building the same boat. Really? Because it does the job. Right, right. Mm -hmm. It's taking a good concept and just making minor improvements That's to make right. it more efficient. That's right. And I taught them to make minor improvements too. They were. At one point, they, they had a stern post like that, square like that, and they got these new propellers and they kept breaking bla blades off. And Yanmar that made the engine and the propellers, we don't understand it. These propellers are so strong that nothing can break them. And yet you're breaking one a month out there. Well, when I got onto it, I had them taper the stern post in so the water just froze that way instead of flowing uh, that way. Right, it was too much uh, and, uh, water force. They wouldn't believe it. Huh. They wouldn't believe it. I had to finally shape the, for the stern post myself the way it should be. And then they finally started doing it. Huh. Um, with all the models in your collection that are going to be donated yeah. to the museum here, are any of them of, of any of your f fishing vessel designs or, or, or any... Di or any sailing vessels that you've designed? Yes, I, I have a nice little half model, which eventually we'll get in this museum, of the, of the Hudson River Ferry Sloop, because uh, the, the clear water was so big that it was hard to get people to sail it, so he wanted to have half-sized vessels, about 26 feet long. Huh. Or, which uh, scattered up the river, and each town would build its own, you know. Pete was a dreamer, <laughs> and uh, it never came to that, but there are a couple of them sailing in the river, hmm. and uh, they're very successful because they can uh, uh, be uh, sailed by, they, they can train their own crews so they don't have to clear <laughs> water right. to get their sailing in. And you have a model of one of those? I have the half model half of, the, of that boat, yeah, right. yeah, right. and that will, uh, I hope, become part of the collection. Mm. Right now, it's part of the collection of my living room. And <laughs> I like to look at it. <laughs> um, what about commercial fishing vessels here in America? Did you do any any commercial fishing designs when you were practicing yes, here? Yes, yes. In fact, I. I uh, take the uh, honor of designing one of the last fishing schooners. You know, did you ever see Captain's Courageous with the Gloucester schooners mm -hmm. and, and uh, the uh, big rigs and everything? Yep. Well, those, as the power came in, those the rigs got smaller and smaller, but they still called them schooners. So I designed a 97-foot trawler when I was at Southwest Boat Corporation. Uh, that had had a hull molded by uh, by um, uh, a man on Cranberry Island, and uh, it was fiberglass. Was it fiberglass? It was not fiberglass. No, it was, it was wood. It was before the war. Okay. So you, they didn't have steel for vessels. Oh. It had nothing. It had a, a, a schooner rig, but the mass was about half size, and it had a foresail, um, um, jumbo, and mainsail, but uh, it was not for sailing. But 
I, I say it's the last uh, fishing vessel, one of the last fishing vessels that was, was designed, I think, uh, Adventurers uh, takes it. But after that, they started using stern, stern trawlers mm -hmm. built of steel. Well, you throw out all the rules when you go that way. And uh, I built some in, uh, designed some in aluminum, on you know, catamarans and things like that. I remember the um, I remember the catamasled project. Ah, uh, yes. That was a sort of a prototype uh, power catamaran design. Correct? Yes, that that was that took two. Uh, anybody here remember sea sleds where the hull was shaped like this? It had a a, a Inverted V on the bottom. And, like, well, uh, they were very difficult to build in the previous materials. Uh, a few years ago, I s decided to build two, take two uh, narrow but long uh, uh, sea sleds and connect, connect them. them with a wing, and they made a fantastic boat, which is official, efficient. I've been thinking of ways of to of developing it. For I, I, I tell you, power catamarans have become very, very popular, especially yeah, in the charter yeah, trades yeah, now, like yeah, down in the Virgin yeah, Islands. Yeah, always. You'll, you'll see as yeah, many yeah, power catamarans yeah, as you will sailing catamarans now. Yes. People love yeah. them. Well, you can get an awful lot more people. I, I've also thought it for uh, Bangladesh. Bangladesh is always losing uh, ferry boats with uh, 100 people dying yeah, or something right. like that. From bad and uh, I want the Society of Naval Architects to design a boat that won't capsize. And the way to do that is to design a a a, 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 a catamaran mm -hmm. with two hulls, which will, will, won't allow it to capsize, and you can. Limit. You just don't have to buy. Put five decks on. You put one deck on, and you can say everybody can get on this deck that wants to, but it's not going to capsize. But they do. Where they have space on these crude built boats. Right. It's uh, it's certainly a more efficient platform for moving people around. Oh, absolutely. It's more comfortable. No question it's more about stable. It. Yeah, yeah it was, more efficient. It much better all in every way. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, so what became of the of the Catamus sled? Did that ever segue into uh, any other any other boats, or was it still a, I, just a prototype? I tried it, and I've got a nice drawing of a forty-three foot uh, um, Coast Guard uh, Catamus sled, huh. which uh, is a great boat. I have to go down and belabor the Coast Guard at some point, see if they'll build one. Right. They'll find out it's uh, remarkable by comparison with their present boats. So the, the prototype, the small one, proved uh, that the oh, concept... Proved, proved to me, yeah, proved to me, first of all, it was always seaworthy. It never gave the least uh, hazard of diving into a sea or anything. Uh, no spray, because all the spray is driven in like this. Inside the tunnels. Inside the tunnel, and yeah. that helps... Lift, lift the boat up, yep. so uh, and it's uh, one one port wanted to design one 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 design for a, uh, a pilot boat, uh -huh. and I thought it'd be just great. Yeah. You could you might not want straight size, but it would be perfect. You would never have any worry about uh, stability or anything like that. Yeah, because certainly those pilot yeah. boats have to go out in the whole weather. That's so, right, yeah. that's right, yeah. that's right. Because huh. now, w w was that was that built around the same time as as the Elder Yacht, or was that, was that uh, after? It was built before that. Before yeah, that, yeah. 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 Huh. yeah. So I think I think we're near I think we're near wrapping we're up. We're not a type yeah. tape, have we? Yeah. Well, yeah. We're, we're getting close. I think it's great that, that that you're able to have the resource of the school here and they're willing to accept all these wonderful models. I I'm tickled to death with Barbara Boko and the work she's doing in getting this going because you know, uh, I'm I'm already writing up getting ready to write a letter to Smithsonian 
and say, look, you guys aren't doing it right. You've got all these American boats all over the place and a few foreign ones stuck away. Yeah. Why not concentrate on the foreign ones, which are, in many ways, far more fascinating. Certainly been around longer. Been, been around <laughs> yeah. longer, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, that was, I've enjoyed talking about it with you, Brian. Well, wonderful and, sight. Thank and, you very much and, for your time. Uh, well, I enjoy giving it. I hope I didn't talk too long. Yeah, no, yeah. I, th I think it was perfect. Thank you. Yeah.